Um, so I have my own private practice now, but I started out basically um, about 12 years ago at All Children's. I out of grad school, I went to All Children's. I'm a trained as a speech pathologist, so I'm a pediatric speech pathologist. Um, but I did my graduate and final training at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in their inpatient ward. And I was like, oh, feeding, I didn't even know that was a thing. You know, I didn't even know we could do that as speech therapists. And it turns out, yes, you can. So that's really what I kind of got into. Um, and so I started out at All Children's here about 12 years ago um, doing, I mean, as a fresh new grad, all their swallow studies and going right into feeding. So um, <clears throat> I used to run their intensive feeding program there for kiddos on feeding tubes. Um, and by the time I left, in October of 16, I was basically the one training all the incoming, or mostly incoming people um, in feeding therapy, evaluations, and small studies. So then I wanted to really get out to my own practice so that I could get out into the community, into schools, into homes, and help with more real life situations. Um, I received very valuable training there, but I can control all these things in my perfect, beautiful office, you know, with all these variables that don't come into play. And so it was really valuable to me to be able to go, like I said, into homes and into schools try and help families um, problem solve real life. <laughs> so that's kind of how I got into this and what really started me on this because I think, and I do speech therapy as well, but the reason feeding is kind of my passion is I think there's so much emotion and stress involved in it that's not recognized. I mean, beyond just for kiddos that you get this kind of instant push pull and the stress about it, depending on the severity of it, a lot of times for parents, there's this kind of mourning period or this stress about it that people don't really acknowledge or don't even realize because it's something that you guys all face every single day throughout the day so it's you can never escape it um, <laughs> and part of the reason I say that is like I know um, my own sister just had a baby so I'm doing this with her when they have even in infancy when you've got kiddos whether they're struggling with nursing whether you've got you know we've got this huge influx of GI issues nowadays that causes so many issues, whether it's picky eating, transition to solids, gagging and hypersensitivity, texture issues, whatever it is, we see such a huge rise in those things. Um, and if you think about it, you know, think about as a baby, you're facing them every couple hours. Oh, gosh, am I going to get the calories in my kid? Am I going to get the ounces in? Or later on in life, oh, I'm dreading lunchtime because I know I'm going to be facing this battle every single day. Um, so that's really why I got into this, so that I can help people manage their own quality of life in addition to their kiddos that I could really help focus on, you know, everybody having a better mealtime experience, which not only obviously sets them up for hopefully a better nutritional profile and better acceptance now, but a better long-term relationship with the food and eating experience anyway, like we all have. I mean, we all enjoy going to restaurants. It's a social experience. It's a fun thing, theoretically, <laughs> you know? Um, so then that's what I hope to give, be able to give back um, to at least either through my help or through giving people pointers on how to get that back in their own families. So, now, I'm gonna refer to my notes here. So, eating is supposed to be fun, right? So that's not always the case, but I mean, think about things, all the fun things that are supposed to be associated with eating, right? So, spoon feeding, birthdays, barbecues, Thanksgiving, there's so many activities that are based on food and eating. You know, trick-or-treating, family dinners, all that stuff we value so much. So much of the quality time that we spend together as families and friends revolves around eating. So there's this expectation when we have our kiddos, or even just this hope, that these times are going to be happy and natural and fun, much like they are for us. So when that doesn't work out, it's kind of what I touched on before, when that doesn't work out depending on the severity of the issue, there's this, there can be this kind of mourning period where parents have to go through. I didn't get that experience that I was expecting, especially when this happens in infancy. That can be really difficult because you didn't get this special bonding, easy thing. But even into toddlerhood, childhood, when you're dealing with this push pull, it's just not what you expect. And so there's a lot of emotion that goes into that. And like I said, there's this stretch you can't escape all day, every single day that you're constantly facing. You know, whether that's battle of what they're going to eat, calorie stress, some kids that have that are diagnosed with failure to thrive, or you're worried about them not getting in enough calories and really struggling. It's just this constant emotional toll, and especially when you're a mom and dad, or any caregiver, you're the guy, right? You're supposed to be the guy who should be able to provide for them and, you know, help them, you know, nurture their nutrition and their intake and all this stuff. And so when you feel like you're failing at that, that's really difficult. And not that you are failing, but I know that a lot of parents obviously take that onus on themselves, and that's really, really difficult. So. 
this red is obviously not ideal. <laughs> All right, so 25% of the pediatric population will experience some level of feeding difficulties. Now, obviously, this increases in children that have certain developmental delays or disabilities. That can be anywhere from 35 to 74%. Um, but up to 50% of two-year-olds were identified by their own caregivers as picky in this 2004 study. So what we need to consider is like, when is typical picky eating, you know, when is it a concern? When is, when is it typical picky eating versus really a problem feeder that needs more help? So sometimes picky eating can be normal. So some certain variations in pickiness can be expected, for example, with a change in growth. Toddlers don't eat as much because they aren't growing as fast in infancy. So that's where you'll oftentimes see these up downs where you see sometimes these big food jags or things where they go up and down and they're eating, oh, they haven't eaten in a couple days, and then all of a sudden they're ravenous, you know, dinosaurs. Um, fighting for independency, so from six months to three years, kids begin looking for more control over their situation, and so food is one of the easiest places for them to exercise that independence. Also, fearful behavior toward things that are new or unfamiliar. Kids thrive on routine, right? So they often need frequent multiple exposures to something new in order to get used to it or to get comfortable with it. So a lot of times, how many times have you guys heard or felt like, oh, well, they tried this, but they didn't like it. I've got kids that, you know, need to try things 15, 20 times for orally and, and even from a comfort level, they can acclimate and be like, all right, that's a safe food now. Or I'm willing to even, some of my more severe kids, even let that be in my presence on the table with me. You know, um, and it just depends on. Yeah, it takes time. So <laughs> you're not alone. Yeah. 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 That's not. I laugh when I'm crying. crying. Yeah. That's not, like, no. I know. You are not alone. It's not <laughs> atypical. You know, you get this immediate, and part of that, like, run out of the house. Yeah. I can't be near this. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that, and I'll go into this more later, but a lot of that too is. There's this immediate expectation on like, <gasps> what are they gonna make me do with that? You know, are they gonna make me try it? Are they gonna make me eat it? And so I have some tips later, but it's ways to kind of ease into that. So that expectation is not just immediate A to B being ingestion. And there's actually, I'm not gonna go into all of them, but there's like 26 interim steps you can take. Oh, and I <laughs> I, most kids don't have to take all 26. <laughs> Um, but there are so many things we can do in between that oftentimes helps bring the pressure off of it on both sides. So you'll find kiddos are a lot more willing to like be around it over time. I mean, this takes time for them to also learn this is a different scenario going on. It doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> so also, busy lifestyles. We have limited time for sitting and eating as a family. You guys all know this. We're all busy. There's so many activities nowadays. We're all go, go, go. So. There's also different, ex different, you know, exposure based on parent preferences. My nieces and nephew are eaters. My brother wouldn't touch a vegetable to save his life. So I mean, this and now granted, this happens, but there's, the model they're getting is also obviously that that doesn't, you know, he doesn't have to eat it. Why do I have to eat it? You know. So obviously, it's good. Their own exposure is going to be different to pace, depending on what their parents are into. Also. Um, the other thing I was going to say about you know things that are new or familiar is that usually again it's most common I hear parents try like three or five times again like you said they'll run like oh well they didn't like it and that can take so many times I have a lot of my older kids I'll actually keep food journals for or food notebooks or sticker books depending on their age and not only do they start to enjoy keeping track of their own progress but it's also a way for them to say oh we haven't hit our 20 times yet you know we can talk about it if you don't like it once we hit our 20 times or whatever and then they can also they also enjoy I have books that I'm like Foods I've smelled, foods, foods I've licked, foods I've kissed. <laughs> and like I've got Velcro, I've got like Velcro pictures of all these foods that they can move the pictures as they're progressing. And like they, it, you know, then it becomes That's like a amazing. fun prime game. game. Exactly. Yeah. And it's a tangible thing they can see. Exactly. Yeah. Rather than how many times to really are we like, a little more. A little more. And a little more, that doesn't mean anything for a kid, right? And I'll go into that too later in terms of your tips and things you can do at home. But it's those tangible things are really helpful, especially when it's a motivating thing where they can feel proud of themselves. Because oftentimes kiddos who are not great eaters have very little opportunity to feel proud of themselves, especially when food related. You know, especially in light of that, they're aware that we're stressed about it, you know? So, in terms of picky eaters or feeding aversion, you may hear a variety of different expressions, right? So picky eaters, finicky eaters, selective eaters, resistant, 
food neophobia, aversion, etc. There's a lot of terms that are used for different kids who either don't eat enough, they eat really slowly, they aren't interested in eating in general, especially um, if any of you have kiddos with like a significant GI history, or even sometimes what is not does not seem like such a significant GI history, but it can see, and that can include colic, etc. And it could be resolved by four months, and parents are like, I had no idea that could impact them later on. If it's <clears throat> some kids, depending on their level of sensitivity, that can actually rewire some neural pathways to kind of decrease that hunger cue. So a lot of those kids you see just don't seem as interested in food. Um, and we can rewire that. We can retrain that interest um, and train them the difference between hunger and satiety and when do they need to eat. Um, but it takes time. Like, you know, much like over in you see those things got, you know, wired that way, we just gotta work on undoing it and creating those positive experiences for them to be able to do that. So, things like picky eating and finicky eating refer refers technically more to things that are temporary. They're typical of a toddler going through like a developmental phase, if you will. Um, in contrast, things like really selective eaters or averse eaters, that might refer to an issue that might be more persistent throughout childhood or have may potentially have an impact on overall health and development. So, and then if you ever hear the, for the term food neophobia, which you may not, that just means fear of trying new foods. So, the difference. T technically, if you think about picky eating being the temporary situation that's more typical, you know, of a developmental toddler phase, Picky eaters usually eat at least one food from each food group. Eating and acceptance may vary depending on their mood or depending on the day. They may have a limited food range, but it's obviously not gonna be as severe or as small as that of a selective or averse eater. Um, they also may stop eating foods previous, previously accepted. You guys have sure experienced this, where kids will get obsessed with a food for like weeks, and then all of a sudden it's like, I don't like mac and cheese anymore. And then you're like, that's the one food I can count on. What do I do? Right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And those types of kids usually will tend to tolerate having a new or undesired item on the plate. They may not eat it, they might taste it, but usually can have it in their sight line without getting too stressed, right? Versus your selective or averse eater. Um, they avoid entire categories of food, you know, like they don't eat any proteins, that's a really common one, or any meats, I should say. It's a really common one for me. Those food jags or eliminations might be more permanent. For example, if their only protein source is cheese, and then all of a sudden they're like, they're off cheese now, what do I do? You know, and then that's really persistent. Um, atypical or unusual aversion. So like, I only like food that's white. <laughs> I had that, I've had that. I like, I had a kid um, when I did, years ago in the intensive feeding program, that drank white milk, plain white grits, and white yogurt, and that's it. Um, so it had, <laughs> kids have interesting ones. So, but I mean, how often do we hear like the tan foods? Kids who only like carby type items, and that's really their go-to. Um, textural aversions or sensitivities, you know, they only like hard crunchy or they can't do soft or they gag on meats. Um, presentation preferences, so like I only eat cookies that are round. If it breaks in half or if a piece breaks off, it is done, right? <laughs> Generalize, you know, if you see a lot of gagging, vomiting, spitting out, or pocketing. If they have trouble, if you notice sometimes pocketing foods, um, that's not always <laughs> typical. Um, also gagging, especially if you notice it's consistent on certain textures. Gagging, let me just say, sometimes depending on the severity, that is in response to a refusal, can be age appropriate. I have like, for example, my niece and nephew, just when they're really upset, they start gagging because it's attention seeking. Yeah. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. but um, it, when it's especially, and again, I deal with that as well from a behavioral standpoint, for, but from a sensory standpoint, when you see it in response to certain textures and stuff, that may be a flag that there's more to it than just kind of your typical you know, developmental phase. Um, generalized heightened anxiety about eating, you know, I've got some kids, um, one kid that I see now that like anytime they go anywhere, he's immediately like, mommy, what did you pack me? Like to make sure that he can have food that he can eat where they are. Um, slightest change, maybe meltdowns, these kids, some of them tend to be really temperature specific, need it really hot, need it room temperature, can't have it really cold, whatever it is, or rigid or unusual mealtime routines. So both of these groups are likely to have a narrow variety of foods, but obviously your selective or averse eater even more so. Picky eaters usually have less than 30 foods. Um, selective eaters probably less than 20. So for example, they might only eat, they might only have red Kool-Aid with grits, 
or they can only drink Coke with pizza, or they only eat one brand of chicken nuggets. <laughs> and you know, they can only have McDonald's chicken nuggets, and then you know, parents are racing all over the place every day because that's the only thing they'll eat. Um, both of these groups may have disruptive mealtime behaviors, but the picky eater, for example, may vary based on their mood, where the other group, the selective or averse eaters, tend to be much more rigid and less tolerant, anxious about seeing new foods, et cetera, et cetera. So some kiddos may gag at even just the sight or vomit, even at the sight of new foods. I've got some kids in the past that gagged or vomited even looking at their high chair um, because it was associated with foods. Yeah, throwing utensils or plates. Um, and then families often find themselves working around these routines to get in whatever nutrition they can, right? So it's this trap that we fall into. Unfortunately, this can also perpetuate that cycle. Um, and it's understandable because as parents, you're just trying to do whatever you can to make sure they eat something, you know? Um, and then we find that the more these routines become more and more rigid, and oftentimes I see that families don't even realize that some of the accommodations they've made until they're like retelling it to me. And they're like, oh wow, I had to eat up those, that rice, you know, six times in a five minute period, whatever. So it was like staying super, super hot. And you know, we just get so used to that being our normal, and you don't realize it until you like see somebody that's just out at dinner with their kid who's willingly eating broccoli, and you're like, what's the googly eye? Like, what is happening over there, you know? So, when is picky eating a problem? So there's a few things we want to consider. So calories, nutrition, and growth, obviously, is paramount health and energy. Growth is the first thing to consider. Kids who fall under the fifth percentile are obviously going to be the ones that are going to raise the first red flag to the doctor. Um, that is not to mean, and I'll go into this too, but a lot of times you'll have kiddos sometimes that um, some physicians may say like, yeah, I mean, you're worried, I'm not really worried about it because their weight's fine, they're still growing fine, but how many kids I know that may drink 60 plus ounces of milk a day? And that's how they're sustaining that weight, right? And so we need to try and figure out that balance. So even if their weight's okay, that doesn't necessarily mean everything's okay. You know, we just have to take that into consideration. Um, Obviously, like I said, I think under, the underweight gets the most attention, but it doesn't mean that your concern is not valid. <laughs> you know, just because their weight's okay. Um, overall development. So overall development, kiddos with developmental issues, as I said, are at higher risk for developing feeding um, concerns. It's obviously more common in children with autism, children with sensory impairments, and other developmental problems, but I also have tons of neurotypical kids who just by luck of the draw also have feeding issues. You know, they're more common in those kids with other diagnoses, but that's not an exclusive thing. Um, and then the other things to consider disruptions and limitations in life routines. So that's kind of, consider your interference in your own daily life. So meal times are often a war for control um, in kiddos with who are picky eaters. So the more mom or dad pushes, the more the kiddo tends to resist. And so families end up either not going to restaurants or working around this increasing list of demands in order to get in any calories they can because the alternative is either too difficult and you're just exhausted, understandably, and it's too hard to fight, or it's too embarrassing. You're out at the restaurant, your kid's having a meltdown, you're not gonna just let it continue on principle, right? Because there's people around and you're trying to just keep the peace. So <clears throat> some parents force feed to get the nutrition in, others give up and give in because it's just, there's, they don't know what else to do. You know, it's either too hard or they don't have the tools to help them, how do I get to this next level? So, I have one of these handouts back there. What should my child's plate look like? General rule of thumb, age one to two is like a tablespoon per year of age for each food. Um, age two to three is like two thirds of an adult portion, and age, age four and above is roughly an adult portion. Some of us adults eat a much larger portion than others, so I mean, use your judgment. But this is also like, I always, I give this plate, I like to show Paris's plate as like a guideline this is not to put extra pressure on people of like, look where you're not making the cut. I mean, this is like in an ideal world when all things are perfect. My own plate doesn't look like this. So I mean, you know, I use this as a guideline, but I, I like to take, I don't use a lot of like shoulds in my therapy <laughs> in general. I'm just kind of like, we're just doing the best we can and let's get to the best place we can be. So, because I just think it adds extra pressure on a situation that's already a pressure cooker to begin with. So I have goals for nutrition, but I'm also very real. So, what can we do about it? How, I don't know, 
depending on your own situation, a lot of us hear the phrase, they're hungry, they'll, they'll eat enough when they get hungry. If they're hungry enough, they're gonna eat. And I, that could be family, but, you know, that could be like grandparents, that could be physicians, that could be anybody. And many people have heard this issue, and many parents come to me um, hearing this quote, basically, and that's actually not necessarily true. So if a kiddo has a true feeding aversion or feeding issue, um, a recent study found hunger alone is not a sufficient motivator to actually get them to eat. I've had several kids that have ended up in the hospital because they would not eat based on that premise. Um, now, some kids, that will work. You know, that's just they're just digging their heels in. But I, I always get bummed out when I hear um, people be given that advice, mainly because I also feel like it's really like invalidating for the parents' own feelings. Like, oh, well, I just got to wait about it. And then plus, who wants to feel like you're starving your kid? Like, that's not fun at all. So um, it's just not necessarily accurate. So use of behavioral interventions, you know, if a kiddo needs to be hungry to a certain extent, for example, if I do feeding therapy, I don't want to come right after the kiddo's just had a big meal. Um, but so use of behavioral interventions is much more effective if they are somewhat hungry. I want them to be motivated to eat somewhat. Um, so they may not be as effective if the kiddo's given unrestricted access to that preferred food. But don't rely on, you know, if, if, you're, if you think a kiddo has a true issue, don't rely on, well, don't eat when they're hungry enough. Because that just may not always be the case. And just so you guys know, so hopefully to avoid any frustration you may hear if you're giving that advice, that's not necessarily true. Um, I will say that we run into this catch-22 when our kiddos don't eat um, a big variety or eat a lot. When you do find yourself chasing the kiddo around and trying to get him whatever calories you can, because those behavioral interventions tend to be more effective on a kiddo who is somewhat, you know, hungry to some extent. Um, we need to resist the urge to allow the kiddo to graze and fill up on those preferred foods because then we won't be able to work on the other foods. And as they get older, it's much more difficult to feed something you can't catch. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, later on, we want them to learn. You know, I always focus a lot on quality and, like, just a good mealtime experience so that we can work on, like, the guidelines and, like, we sit at the table to eat together and we do whatever. Even if it means I'm starting out in therapy with easier foods, I like to teach those baseline expectations so that we can work on quality for everybody overall moving forward. Um, this is an extreme example, but it always makes me think of, um, I've obviously had a lot of kids in the past with feeding tubes. And um, when I was doing the intensive feeding program, one of the goals was obviously to wean the kiddo off their feeding tube. That's great, we did it in a very monitored way, it was fine. But um, through my years at the hospital, I remember um, having parents who were so desperate to either get the feeding tube out no matter what the cost. Like they weren't really in their calorie goals or their intake goals, but they were like, I'll just force it in however I can just to get that tube out. Or kiddos who are at risk of getting a tube and at all costs parents wanted to avoid it. And so we're struggling so much and you basically have to sacrifice so much of the quality, right? You have to kind of throw quality to the wayside to just go calorie, calorie, calorie all day long. And think about it as the kiddo gets older, their calorie needs get more and more, right? So I always say to parents, I'm like, we're trying to hit, it's a moving target. We're running up a down escalator because it's gonna be a battle we face forever because we never get to focus the time on that quality because we're constantly trying to play catch up as the kiddo grows, um, which is very stressful itself. You know, you may be stressed about having the G2 now, and I'm not diminishing that, you know, but kiddos who are, or parents who are kind of desperate and sad and want their normal, you know, want what they were picturing, um, but then we sacrifice this other area that honestly can be much more long-standing, can be much more long-term if we lose that quality piece on the way. So, um, oh, yeah. what can we do about it? Sorry, I can talk a lot. <laughs> so, one of the things that's easy to do, kind of as I said, about not letting them graze all day is establishing a routine. Um, the key in all of this is routine and consistency. So predictability, slow, gradual change, it's not going to change overnight. Positive focus and then those opportunities for a positive experience. So trying to eliminate that grazing, comfortable, well-supported seating. This matters 
even more for kids who have other developmental issues because they can, like kids who have motoric issues and stuff need more support. But anybody in general, I like to see them not flopping all over the place. Or I like kiddos if we can have them whether when they're smaller in a booster or something where they can feel like it's an age appropriate size seat. Um, and allowing independence and control, but within the boundaries you set. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, establishing minimum requirements. So remember, you want to be successful, so adjust. So a lot of times, for example, when I do therapy, I can get a kid to eat things with me. They're not going to mimic that yet for mom and dad, because mom and dad are not the environment they're used to having to do that in. So a lot of times I'll give parents a much smaller goal so that they can get used to doing something for mom and dad that's easy. Mom and dad can still be successful. Mom and dad can then feel good about that. Kiddo can learn. I still have to do something for mom and dad. And then throughout therapy, we get mom and dad more and more involved, and I get less and less involved so that we start to adjust. They understand that they have to do it for everybody. So in that sense, it's really important all feeders are really consistent, right? How many times do we have, like, well, I'm much tougher than mom is or dad is or grandma less than me, whatever they want. So it's really important. Kids are super, super smart, and they'll learn who they can play, for lack of a better word, to see how they can get their desired outcome. So it's really important all um, feeders are consistent. So also, offer smaller portions. I have so many people, even if we say, it's kind of goes back to what we were saying before about that tangible thing. When kids understand in a very simple, obvious way what's being asked of them, they tend to be a lot more resistant. So if I have a bowl of broccoli, yeah, even if I say you only have to take three bites, and I know that seems like a lofty goal to some but let's just use this as an example. If I have a bowl of broccoli out and I say you only have to take three bites, I am much more likely to get a kiddo who screams and resists versus if I have three tiny pieces of broccoli in front of them and that's it. And I'm like, make those gone and we're done. Because visually, it's much less overwhelming to see those little pieces than it is to see a big bowl full of stuff, even if I'm telling them the same thing. So, um, also, be concrete and visual. Like I said, I have the broccoli example up here. All, another thing I always say is mean what you say. In all areas, mean what you say. So kids learn really fast with me as a therapist. I mean when I say positive or negative. We're playing with the toy. Sometimes I use toys in therapy um, initially to kind of establish a difference because kids who've had really negative experiences, be the experience with food or just anxiety around food, we want to find a way to rewire those pathways. And one of the ways to do that is to bring some positive and fun back into it. Um, I'll show you an example of some of those plates later, but sometimes I'll use toys temporarily to try and rewire that. So I might say, take one bite and you get a turn on the game. I mean it, they understand, take one bite, you get a turn on the game. Contrastingly, if they don't do it, if I say, ah, oh, we need to, you know, if we spit that food out again, then the game's gonna be all done. If they do, I mean it and that game is gone. Same thing of how many of us fall into the trap of like, if you don't do this, we're not going to McDonald's later, but you still end up going to McDonald's later. <laughs> so it's really important to set rewards or consequences that you feel comfortable sticking to. I've had parents who are like, listen, we're going to a birthday party later, but I really want to be able to have cake with his friends. And I'm like, that's fine. Just don't make your consequence. You're not gonna get cake with your friends. Yeah. Make it something you're comfortable following through on. Um, so in the same way, all of us as humans are much more likely to kind of get greedy, as I call it. If we say, okay, two more bites and you're done, and the kiddo takes their two bites, how many of us want to go, great, can you do one more? And then they're like, you said two. I always liken this to, years ago I did um, <laughs> like a cardio kickboxing class or something. And we did this like round of moves, and she was like, okay guys, one more and we're done. And I was dying, so I'm like, oh my God. So we do one more round and we're, and we're done. And then she's like, who wants to do one more? And the whole class is like, yeah. And I was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> one more. and so I'm, you know, dying, going through the routine. And then, no lie, this happened like six more times. And she was like, okay, one more again. And at the end, I was so frustrated. And this is me as like a 30-year-old. I was so frustrated. I want, and I didn't, but I wanted to just be like, I'm out of here. Like, I just want to give, I was so tired. I was so done that the fact that I now could no longer trust what this woman was saying, I was so frustrated and I was so important. So we need to all follow the rules. The kid understands, no matter how excited I might be, that they just willingly took two bites of turkey with minimal issue, I need to resist being like, 
can you do one more? Because if I said two, they're done at two. Um, so, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, um, let me make sure I didn't miss anything here. Yeah, follow through. I, I said everything I wanted. So positive or negative. So just make those consequences you can follow through on. And also, if they do something good, lately they can be done when they're told to. I think I do go into this here. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some more specific behavioral things you can do too. Um, so we are already doing all of those things you said. Mm -hmm. All of those things. How do we keep going? How do we next step? Do we introduce one new food a week? One new food a meal? How? So it depends on the kiddos. I, I'm very much not, I will, and I'm happy to answer this now and talk to you after as well. Um, I'm very not cookie cutter at all. So it really, I try to gauge off the emotion of the reaction of the kiddo and how sensitive they are to change. Yeah. So some kids do better with like targeting one new food at a time. You, I don't tend to do, I will say in therapy, I don't tend to say, we're doing, um, it basically is a new food every time, because then they never get to get comfortable and know what to expect. Usually I'll target the same couple of foods for several sessions. When we start to make progress with one of them, I might switch out the second foods. They still have one familiar, somewhat familiar food, even if they're not great at it yet. Um, and then one newer food. And so I start, it's kind of like a ch I'm chaining it that way, so that it's not always a new thing they're getting used to. Now, so some kids may move at a pace where it's one a week. Some may need a day or two days where they see a couple meals in a row and they're like, okay, this isn't as bad. Um, and I am going to go into some more of that because I want to talk about ways, things you can do when you're introducing new foods too, um, which you may already do. But <clears throat> try focusing on the positive. So kids with feeding issues have been told or they're aware, they're very aware, they're not great at eating. Right? So most of these kids are aware their parents are stressed out or they can overhear us talking about like, oh, well, they're a picky eater. Oh, well, I don't know what Joey's going to eat you know, when we go on this cruise. They know. You know, they're very smart kids. So they're aware we're frustrated. So as hard as it is, I think I always try to talk to parents about this when I do an evaluation, is we all are kind of, in, we have this ingrained in us to go into each mealtime with that dread. And it sets both of you up for kind of this miserable experience. So one of my first goals is always to try to rewire that kind of dynamic so that we can go in with like a much more positive vibe. That doesn't mean they're gonna be eating all these things next meal, but we can do some things that are successful and everybody can feel good afterward. Um, so, things that happen like gagging, vomiting, cries for attention, as much as you can, try and ignore that. I've got a lot of kids who have issues with gagging and things like that and going in different textures. I don't give much attention to that. I'll try to redirect them, like, what are we going to do later today? And I'll try to pull them out of it if I have to, um, if you guys ever need this tip. Um, kids who have a sensory thing going on, like if it's a sensory issue, if they're gagging because of the texture. Um, Usually a motor task can pull their brains out of that sensory thing. So if you need to um, work on like, for instance, like clap their hands after you or tapping the table, something that's a motor input task can sometimes trick them out of their brains out of doing that. Um, <clears throat> other times I've got kiddos where if I'm like, I see it coming, like, <laughs> I see that, like um, I'm immediately like, you ready for your next turn? And as soon as they start playing the game, then they're okay. So it just depends on the kid and their level of sensitivity in that. But I do try to ignore it or at least redirect it and not give the like, which we all do, like, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay. Because, they, <laughs> because even though we're trying to reassure them, it's still drawing attention to that thing, which can make it persist. Okay? It's much like when a kiddo falls and looks to you for the reaction. It, we don't want to like draw like draw attention to that's the thing we should be paying attention to, as long as it's not a safety concern, obviously. Yeah. Teaching control and being consistent. So like, use specific praise. I love how you chew that on your big girl teeth. Wow, you are a good drinker. You know, all this stuff is really specific praise that kids can understand exactly why you're proud of them and why you're happy. Kids love attention, so it kind of goes back to the gaggy thing. Kids love attention, even if it's negative attention. If they're thrown off, I have had kids, now this is obviously a more severe case, two dependent kids who, because of history of significant reflux, they can vomit really easily. They used to get mad at me, and so they would vomit at me on purpose. And like, even if it's negative attention, they love attention, right? 
So I try to not give any attention to the stuff I don't want, and I give a ton of attention to the stuff I do want. So, <laughs> so the quicker, the more we can minimize our attention to those negative behaviors, those ones we don't want, the quicker it will subside. And they will try. You have kids who like, you know, will scream and stuff, and when that doesn't work, and I'm ignoring them, then they'll start throwing stuff. Is that going to work? And eventually they'll escalate, and that means a lot of parents will go, well, I tried that, but then he started, you know, he threw the food instead. And they think it means it wasn't working. Oh, it was. They were testing you then. <laughs> so the more you can persist through that, the quicker it will subside. But Again, then I try so much to focus on the good stuff. It goes back to me saying, like, kiddos are aware that we're frustrated. They're aware that they're not great eaters. So there's very few opportunities. So there's just not a lot of time for them to feel really, really good about themselves with eating. So I really try to focus a lot on highlighting things they did great. So um, one of the kiddos I see here um, will be in class. And now this is a kid who's known for the last four years that family is very frustrated, all caregivers, grandparents, parents, and I came in, and I think, now obviously I understand I'm an outside force, so I don't come into this with the same years of, you know, built up dread and everything else. But it's for the child's benefit too, because then all of a sudden I come in and I came into the class, and um, we started with something I knew she could eat, an easier food, because I want to develop good rapport first. Um, and I remember being like, Wow, you are a good cruncher. You have the strongest teeth. I didn't know you had such strong teeth. And then all of a sudden, everyone around the table and across the classroom is going, Christina, Christina, listen to my crunch. Listen to my crunch. And the whole class is trying to show me how loud they can crunch. And so, and I, and so all of a sudden, I'm like, who is going to do the Superman crunch next time? And then they're like, me, 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 me. And now all of a sudden, I got my kid eating bell peppers and carrots because they're the crunchiest sounding foods. And she knows she's good at it. She has really strong teeth. And so yesterday she was eating turkey because I was like talking about how her muscles were exploding and carrots were good for her eyes and all these things. And it becomes like a competition among them and I use that to my advantage. But um, also these are kids who are very powerful because we get so focused on like, come on, just take the bite, just try it, it's not a big deal, just do it. It's this constant negative thing that all of us are so used to that we just, that kiddos have, they're not hearing like, Wow, I love how you smell that. A kid who runs away at the sight of something, if we get to the point where I'm not worried about them eating yet, I take that off the table for a while. And I teach them all these other tricks to do with the food. Um, I don't know if any of you have been through feeding there before or where you have. I sometimes, depending on the kid, I don't always do this, use um, something that I call like an all bun bowl or a five by bowl, um, which is basically it's that mean what you say thing. If I tell them they can do something to put it in that bowl, once they do, that bowl means it's gone. They don't have to bring it back out. They're done with it. So if I've got five bites of hamburger, um, if I say, like, you want to give it a, and this is another thing. We'll talk about choices. But give it a lick or a kiss to be done with it. If they choose lick and they lick it and put it in the bowl and it's done, that bite is gone. And so when all five of those bites are gone in that bowl, then they're done with it. Now, that's one of those, you know, A, you know, through Z steps until we hit ingestion, but when they start to learn there's all this other stuff they can do with the food that's less threatening than just, oh wait, you don't expect me to eat this? Like I've got so many kids who are like, oh, no, I don't want to eat it. And I went, I didn't say anything about eating it. We're going to do some tricks today. I'm going to teach you some tricks. And I teach him knock, knock. And I teach hide and seek. And we lick it. And we kiss it. And we hold it on our tongues with no hands. And that's a competition too with everybody that's around. And they learn, oh, it's not scary. I can, now for lack of a better word, play with it. It becomes much less fearful then. And they can also, even subconsciously, from a sensory perspective, get used to those foods without even realizing it. And realize it's not so scary. And they also get used to how it tastes and how it feels. And all those things without even realizing it. So by the time we get to ingestion, and I'm all of a sudden like, okay, you want a baby bite? Or you want a big bite? Or you want a crummy bite? And you want a mouse bite or a dinosaur bite? <coughs> yep. And they'll like take a bite off of it. So they get a lot more confidence that way because those are all 26 things then that I can compliment them on and tell them how well they're doing with it. And those opportunities just weren't there before. We're just focused on that push pull in that tug of war, right? So um, <clears throat> my number one behavioral strategy here, when I'm saying give choices like blue bowl or red bowl, whenever you can, because feeding is so much of a battle for control, is avoid yes or no questions. So like if we're like, can you try it? Can you take a bite? Do you want the, do you want the, you know, do you want your broccoli? No. So then we have, we're stuck because we either end up with 
I force feed it and teach them I don't really care what you said. Or they never have to try anything new in their whole life. So instead, I try to reframe it in a choice. So let's say I've got my, you want to, what do you want to have today? Do you want your Peppa Pig spoon or do you want your Paw Patrol spoon? Or do you want your Red Bull or your Blue Bowl? Do you want a big drink or a little drink? Do you want broccoli or carrots? I help parents with how to frame. And I, in the beginning of therapy, I usually am like, think about your daily routine. Think about your next meal. If I had parents, I'd be like, videotape each other. You'd be amazed. It's how we interact with everybody. Yes or no questions is how we all interact as people. It was the single hardest thing for me to learn as a therapist was to undo that. Um, and so it's a really difficult thing to try and be like, okay, can you try? Can you take your next bite? And a lot of times after parents get used to it, be like, like I can see it again, and I'm like, no, it's normal. It takes a long time to undo. But turning everything into a choice, because that's what gets the control back in your favor. Kiddos feel like they have control, right? They can make a choice that they decide, but they have to choose one of the options I present. Now, it does not mean that I'm going to start out tomorrow, and a kid who doesn't eat anything will go, do you want broccoli or carrots? And they're magically going to go, yeah, broccoli. But I can start on a much lower level. I can go back to one of those lower steps. Do you want to give it to me or put it in the bowl yourself to be done with it? Something like that, something where they can be successful. There's also because things like give to me, I can hand over hand them to do it, right? And even if they're really mad that I did it, I can ignore that and be like, you did it, high five, you made it all done, whatever it was. And so they can understand like this is happening whether I really want to or not. It's much more fun if, you know, Christina seems excited even though I was mad. Um, so, um, so trying to turn everything into a choice is huge. It's one of my um, handouts up there. Um, it's, it's only got a couple examples, but use it as kind of a way to think to yourself as you're going through your next meal, like how can I turn all these things into choices? I have parents a lot of times like, make a list for yourself or like videotape yourself and then go back through it later, like how can I have made that a choice? You know, bigger little bite, bigger kiss, blah, blah, blah. Um, Always, and this is one of the things that I was talking to Sherry about too, in addition to the positive praise thing and trying to bring that positivity back into meal plans, as much as you can enlist your child's help in all things food related, that's also really great. Um, whether that's meal prep, whether that's going to like a you pick farm and talking about all the fruits and vegetables you can find, whether like they have the garden, you know, they have garden and stuff, access to gardening and stuff here. All this stuff that they have is great, or even if you take some of the pressure off of them eating, if you've got food-related games, play food, like grocery food, um, if you get out, for example, dry rice versus flour versus sugar, and let's get, let's get in there, it's gonna be messy, get in there and talk about how it feels, how does it look, what's the color, is it smoother, is it bumpy? All those food-related experiences that are not the pressure of what are they gonna make me do with it can be really beneficial. Um, and so I really like to utilize that whenever possible and say, you know, whenever you guys can go on, you know, like how you do like a food scavenger hunt around the house, or if I'm not worried about, let's say, Sally eating it today, but we're all sitting at the, as a family at the table and she's only got her chicken nuggets, fine, but maybe daddy has carrots and rice and steak. Let's have, a, let's have a bet on which one do you think is going to make the loudest crunch. Do you think Daddy's going to make a loud crunch with the steak or with the carrots? And then sit there together as he eats it. And so we can listen as Daddy crunches it. And so the pressure is off of, are they going to make me do it? But all of a sudden the food is less scary because it has different sounds, different tastes, different um, textures, different, you know, all that stuff. So it can, it can bring in a lot more other details about the food and a lot more awareness and less scariness, for lack of a better expression, about it than just immediate heels dug in or they get what's expected of me with this food. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, and I will go into, I'll be happy to talk to you, like I'm saying, it's hard in like a general setting on how much to introduce at once, but I'm happy to talk to you after too about like where you're at currently so that I can try to help you get to the next step. <laughs> So, oh, one other thing I was gonna say about being positive. I do, you know, if you find, there's a lot of read books about food, if you guys know, like Pete the Cat has a free bite rule book. Any books you can find that are food related, I think are really cute. Um, and I just try to be really as animated and positive. Think about how often we're dreading, and I kind of go back to like, if we're sitting there in this kind of like, ugh, like, come on, just do it. It becomes a really negative experience. One thing I love to do, I'm really animated, obviously, when I talk to kids, so when I talk to the kiddos during the therapy, and it's not necessarily even always about the food, or it might be. I might look me over the plate going, 
I spy, and I'll talk about something on their plate or in the room or whatever, and like that makes it a lot more fun. Or versus sitting there in silence, if they're if they are eating or they're chewing, a lot of these kids take a long time to chew, where they can pocket their foods rather than come on, swallow it, come on, swallow it, come on, swallow it. If they're working on it, and I know from a motor perspective they're working on it, I'll say I won't necessarily sit there in silence so it's boring because kids are going to get bored. He wants to sit there for 30 minutes plus, you know, while it's silent and boring. So instead, I'll be like. What do you think you're gonna do this weekend? What do you think it'd be fun to do? Do you think it'd be fun, more fun to go to the beach, or do you think it'd be more fun to go to the park? And like, so I just talk, 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 talk constantly. I don't care what I'm talking about. You know, I need to be made up. You know, and I did this weekend. I went to Dinosaur World, and then I went to Legoland, and then I walked around the park, and I saw a funny spider. And I just like talk all the time because it's much more interesting for them, especially if it's this fun. I mean, she seems entertained, so you know. It's, 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 not, it's not as you know. It's not this constant like, come on, and then they're sitting there like, and it's just boring. They just want to escape. So, if your kiddo, if you do a lot of these things at home, you know, some of these behavior things, you're doing positive talking, you're doing all the positive experiences, you're trying to avoid the yes/no questions, you're trying to give them choices and allow the independence, but really put your foot down where you need to. There are obviously going to be kids who need more help than that. Um, not always. Some kids that as you start to make some of these changes and just focus more on the positive um, will come along on their own. Um, one of my favorite things in therapy is when you start to see for the first time, it's like one of the, it's my favorite thing that happens, but when I have parents that come back to me and are like, first time ever, they're actually like curious what's on my plate. I've lived six years with a kid who couldn't care less what was on my plate or what was going on around them. And now, whether they're eating it or not, I have one little girls too, who like, now she's like, what's that, Dada? And she's looking at the food. And then like the next couple times later, I was there and we were all eating dinner together. And um, like she went and he, I was like, do you think he's gonna make a loud crunch or a soft crunch? I was like, do you think it's salty or sweet? She's like, and picked it up and tasted it. And her dad said to me, he was like, it's the first time I've ever seen her be care at all or be anything less than defensive about all the food that was around her. And so that switch to curiosity was always my like favorite phase because we're turning the corner and I see those fish just some curiosity. So it's always a fun thing. But some kids are gonna get there on their own and then obviously some are gonna need further um, outside help, mainly because some kiddos, depending on the level of severity or their own personalities, are gonna be so used to a certain dynamic at home or with parents that it's gonna be much harder for parents to be able to change that dynamic just because the kiddo's ingrained and this is the way it is with mom and dad um, or grandma or whoever um, and need an outside person. It just depends on the kiddo. Um, so if your kiddo needed further intervention, um, you might consider an evaluation with a speech pathologist who specializes in feeding. Um, evaluations usually will just include, you know, generalized thorough case history, talking about your concerns and what your goals are. Again, I'm also not in the business. I want the best nutritional profile and obviously health and growth as we all do for your kiddos. But I don't operate a lot in like shoulds. Well, this is what you should have them eating. This is what you should. I'm very realistic. Like, what is your family? What would you like them to eat? What are your goals? Because if I'm telling you like they should be eating X, Y, and Z, but these are things you never eat at home, then that's not gonna be useful for you at home. You know, I want stuff that's realistic that's gonna make your own life easier. I've got a couple kids that started seeing me last year because the family, one was about to go on a cruise and one had just gone on a cruise. And they were like, it was miserable because you can't bring food on the ship. And so, there was nothing they could eat the whole time, and the whole time I panicked, he's hangry because he could not, you know, he could eat a little bit of the fruit that was on the ship, but he wouldn't eat anything else. And so a lot of like our goals were just trying to figure out, like, okay, how can we get enough generalized acceptance of a handful of food so that you can go places? That you can, whether it's a few different, you know, different kinds of pizzas, so you can go to a theme park, whether it's a few different foods so that you can go on vacation, it's just enough stuff so that you feel like you have options when you go places. Um, so, talking about current skills and problem behaviors, problem behaviors, um, development of a treatment plan and then recommendations and referrals for other disciplines if that was warranted. Um, treatment usually is once to twice a week, it can be more or less depending on the child's needs. I've got some kids who are pretty mild um, or, you know, for other commitments parents can only do once a week, that's doable and that just means I give them more stuff to work on at home. Um, I've got some kids, one that I see five days a week. Um, so it just depends on the kiddo um, and what they need and what the family's needs are. 
Um, that being said, so like I said, intensive treatment is needed. Each time I'll give the family usually something to work on at home, which is usually a lesser version of whatever I did that session. Because um, I don't expect, they're not going to be able to be successful that way, and I want everybody to be successful. Um, and then I usually, like I said, I get the parent more and more involved as sessions go on. Sessions usually start very therapist heavy, and you know, sometimes parents aren't even in the room because seeing them, the kid will try to escape to them the whole time. Sometimes they are. If I can keep them in the room, I always try to. Um, but it just depends on the kiddo, and then once we get in the routine, then sometimes we're at school, so it's different. But um, if I can, and then as soon as I can start reintroducing parents so they can get used to doing that thing for everybody, the better. Um, and if the key here is always follow through. I always joke, it's one of my parents' here. I was joking with the kiddo I see, one of the kiddos I see here. I was joking with mom, and she's like, I know, I haven't been doing this stuff at home. Now, see me. Kiddo will improve, it just takes more time. The more work you can put into it at home, the faster it improves, the more consistent you can be at home. And I always try to think and tell people, like, it's like keeping your head down and it's really stressful and like can be hard now, but it gives you a much better long-term outcome and you'll get there a lot faster <laughs> the more you can keep your head down and plug away now. Um, and so that's my patient's mom that I love. I see here now, she's like, oh, I haven't been doing this stuff at home. And I'm like, you're my summer project. Like, <laughs> I know, I know. And then I'm like, all right, you're my summer project. Because I know it's hard. You also, as parents, it's not, and it's not your fault, we all get ingrained and used to a routine. So it is also, just like it is for the kids now a job when they're coming in therapy with me, it's also a conscious effort to now think of, like, how do I undo this? Or, like, how do I make this... Um, how do I set this up so I can be successful at home? And a lot of times for that reason, I'll start with parents, like start with a snack or something. Don't try to tackle family dinner where it's hectic anyway. Start with a snack or some time where you can specifically devote those 15 minutes or whatever, it doesn't be an hour, to you know doing these few things and then let it be done. I try to be really, really, really realistic about that. So um, this kind of goes back to having the parents more and more involved in sessions. Parent caregiver involvement is so important as feeding therapy. I'm not. I don't live with you. So even if you know, kiddos are in session with me a couple times a week, all those other meals are at home. So I always try to give parents whatever they can do, like I said, that's realistic and that's feasible when they are at home. At the end of the day, I always kind of have this talk with parents when we first start. I'm like, you are the expert on your kiddo, right? I am the expert on the feeding issues, so we have to work together to get the best outcome. We all have the same goals at the end of the day, so I need your expertise on your kiddo and mine on how to deal with behavioral and sensory feeding issues, and then we all come together to get to those goals you tell me about at the beginning that you're trying to get to. Um, and so essentially, I'm not just gonna be the only one teaching your child how to eat, I essentially teach the parents how to become feeding therapists so that you can learn how to teach your child how to eat or how to get to that next step, um, and what the next steps are, you know, in some cases. Um, so, I mean, I think that's pretty much it. I have some handouts back there. I want to show you one quick thing. I have some handouts back there. One of them was like, how do I get control back? And about, um, that's the one about uh, giving choices instead of yes, no questions. And the other one is just about establishing positive mealtime routines and just general guidelines to set up for like avoiding grazing, <laughs> meal and snack schedule and that sort of thing. Some easy kind of some, somewhat fun ways to incorporate things that are less stressful and less um, less pressure on the kiddo is like this is a thing called eight the plate, um, which is like a kind of plate you can essentially spin this thing. You put a different food, and the kiddo can help you. Again, this is like meal prep. Let's say you do this sort of snacks. You don't have to do an extra thing for dinner. Um, but like you could like you do the meal prep, so the kid gets to pick a few things. You've got let's say I don't know twelve different foods out. That's a lot, but you're gonna, if you're gonna set up all eight of these, they can help you choose what goes in each one. And so maybe a few of them are things you know they love. A few of them are meh, hit or miss foods. And then there's a couple that are totally new or usually dig your heels in food. And so this thing essentially spins and you can spin it and make it like a game and like take turns. Oh, mommy, is it mommy's turn or your turn? Is it daddy's turn or your turn? And then, oh, my daddy did the last one. I'm, you're gonna do this one. And so you spin it and the kid up confused, okay, what are we, let's say you start on a food that you know they're like, it's a no-go. What do you think we should do? Should we smell it or should we kiss it? And so, you know, to see how it feels. Is it cold or is it warm? And start, even if they're not up to smelling it or kissing it yet, let's talk about the food that you see that it lands on. And what color is it? How do you think it would feel? How do you, if mommy takes a bite, do you think it would make a loud crunch or a soft crunch? So it can kind of take some of the pressure off and it also makes it fun. Do you have like suggested meal plans? Like even sitting here, I'm like, I can't even think of eight foods to put in that thing. So 
so I could have ideas. <laughs> or even like we actually use those plates where it's like the little path and each of the kids has their own thing. There's like, yeah, and we use yeah. that, but I'm like, man, I can't think of that many things. So it ends Some of them can be repeats. Some of them can be repeats, especially if they have like only a, a couple foods that are space. Um, <laughs> I can come up with food. Basically, I have um I did a training for you can just see ones of these, which are actually kind of fun. Um and I can give you, I can email you like compare handouts on it. It's about like food chaining. I did this um, SOS is an approach to it's, a, it's one of the approaches to feeding therapy, um, and I did a big training on that. And so they talk about how you can approach all the different foods. You're welcome, um, and how you chain them. So for example, each food in each category has to be linked by one thing. So let's say green beans is here. Well, it's green and it's also a long stick. So next could be veggie straws, even if they're orange, because they're as long as stick shape. And then they're crunchy, so the next one could be crackers, because even though they're round, they're crunchy, so they all share one characteristic to the next. I have a handout specifically on that, so whether they're linked by um, temperature, color, shape, uh, feel, like crunchy versus soft, and they're all linked by one thing. Um, we use also, a lot of herbs. Couldn't you do like herbs? Yeah, for, sure, for sure. So green beans with rosemary. Yep. Or green beans with basil. Because mm -hmm. not all that of these have to be. Oh, you were advanced. Huh? <laughs> Remember helper that's kind of wet and there's no defined bite in there. It can be very difficult versus like a green bean, a baby carrot, or a baby carrot that's cut in little slices is much easier than for some kids mac and cheese or something you know like chicken salad that's like all gloppy and goopy and there's no defined bite can be much more difficult so start with those things that for lack of a better word have defined bites even if it's a grilled chicken that's cut in pieces it's easier than something that's just like a big glob of something. i also have um a dietitian that works for me as well so she can also help with me with plans and that sort of thing.